Good evening. Good evening. So um, our worship service this evening comes straight out of the Book of Common Worship. Wow, that sounds really loud. That's what it means to be on Sunday. Yes. So it comes straight out of our Book of Common Worship, exactly as written. I think I cut one section out. This is not a joyful, happy, bubbly service, but throughout it, we remember that God loves us, no matter what. And as I was reading through it again um, this evening, after I finished it, reading through it, my granddaughter called me on the phone. Because this morning, when I saw her, I said, Grandma has to work tonight. Grandma's going to be at church. She probably won't be back in time before you go to bed. And that's when we had weeping and gnashing of teeth, which (laughs) is in here. So my my, um, son handed her the phone, and she called me on FaceTime so she could see Grandma. I sometimes think that that's what it's like for us with God. Sometimes we're weeping and gnashing our teeth and we're wondering, where is God? And um, we are happy when we remember that God sees us always and loves us, even when we don't think we see God. So... When we come to the point at the end of the service for the ashes, you can choose not to have ashes. You can choose to have it put on your hand, or you can choose to have it put on your forehead. So if you don't want ashes, don't come forward. If you want it on your hand, stick your hand out. Otherwise, I'm going for your forehead. (coughs) So, peace of Christ be with you. Our opening sentences. God sent Christ into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God's love endures forever. God is our refuge and strength, a present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, Though the mountains tremble with its tumult, God's love endures forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, you despise nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who trust in you. Create in us new and contrite hearts that truly repenting of our sins and acknowledging our brokenness we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 824, There is a Place of Quiet Rest. You may either stand or seat, whatever is your, stay seated, whatever is your pleasure.
We start with an Old Testament lesson from Joel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, and verses 12 through 17. These are about the dark days and the tough times. Blow the horn in Zion, give a shout on my holy mountain. Let all the people of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and no light, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread out upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes, unlike any that has ever come before them or will come after them in centuries ahead. And even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your hearts, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts, and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. Who knows whether he will have a change of heart and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the horn in Zion, demand a fast, request a special assembly, gather the people, prepare a holy meeting, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the, let the groom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the porch and the altar, let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep. Let them say, have mercy, Lord, on your people, and don't make your inheritance a disgrace, an example of failure among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And from the epistles, we have a portion of Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. We start with part of chapter 5 and move into chapter 6. I think this is getting at the need not to get distracted by what other people think or even say about you. So we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. God caused the one who didn't know sin to be sin for our sake, so that through him we could become the righteousness of God. Since we work together with him, we are also begging you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He says... I listened to you at the right time, and I helped you on the day of salvation. Look, now is the right time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We don't give anyone any reason to be offended about anything so that our ministry won't be criticized. Instead, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in every way. We did this with our great endurance through problems and disasters and stressful situations. We went through beatings, imprisonment, riots. We experienced hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger. We displayed purity, knowledge, patience, and generosity. We served with the Holy Spirit, genuine love, telling the truth, and God's power. We carried the weapons of righteousness in our right hand and our left hand. We were treated with honor and dishonor, with verbal abuse and good evaluation. We were seen as both fake and real, as unknown and well-known, as dying, and look, we are alive. We were seen as punished, but not killed, as going through pain, but always happy, as poor, but making many rich, as having nothing, 
but owning everything. And from the Gospel according to Matthew, we have portions of the sixth chapter. It deals with issues of motivation and knowing your why. Hear the good news. Be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is present in the secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. And when you fast, don't put on a sad face like the hypocrites. They distort their faces so people will know they're fasting. I assure you that they have their reward. When you fast, brush your hair and wash your face. Then you won't look like you're fasting to people, but only to your father who is present in that secret place. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. Stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth, where moth and rust will eat them and where thieves break in and steal them. Instead, collect treasures for yourself in heaven, where moth and rust don't eat them and where thieves don't break in and steal them. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So this is an invitation to observe a holy Lent. Beloved people of God, every year at the time of the Christian Passover, we celebrate our redemption through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, a.k.a. Easter. Lent is the time to prepare for this celebration of Easter and to renew our life in the Paschal Mystery. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We begin our journey to Easter with the sign of ashes. This ancient sign speaks of the frailty and the uncertainty of human life and marks the penitence of this community. I invite you, therefore, in the name of Christ to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and penitence, by prayer and fasting, by works of love, and by meditating on God's word. Now let us bow before God, our creator and redeemer, and confess our sin. We are going to engage in a responsive reading of Psalm 51, verses 1 through 17. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your 
great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and right in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness, that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let me teach your ways to offenders and sinners shall be restored to you. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you take no delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifice of God is a troubled spirit, a troubled and broken heart, O God, you will not despise. As we prepare to receive the ashes, we repent. This is a litany of penitence, and I do the bulk of the reading, and you're going to respond periodically with, Have mercy on us, O God. Holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth that we have sinned by our own fault in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have not listened to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. We confess to you, O God, all our past unfaithfulness for the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. Have mercy on us, O God, for our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people. Have mercy on us, O God. For our anger at our own frustration and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves, have mercy on us, O God. For our intemperate world love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work, have mercy on us, O God. For our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to commend the faith that is in us, have mercy on us, O God. Accept our repentance, O God, for the wrongs we have done, 
for our neglect of human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Have mercy on us, O God. For all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and for our prejudice and contempt towards those who differ from us. Have mercy on us, O God. For our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God of our salvation, and show us your steadfast love. Turn to us in your mercy and redeem us. So we don't put on these ashes as a way to declare anything to the world. We do it because we've just recited a litany of all the various ways that we have sinned. And we know that life has an end. And we know who created us. And we know who loves us and who forgives us. We know who died for us and who reigns in power for us. We know who inspires us and who nudges us. And we know that in this next year, we're going to fall short again. But this day, we receive the ashes to remind us that we are dust, and to dust we will return. And in this next year, we may come closer to God. We may be better neighbors, but that's a commitment we make this day. If you get your ashes and y'all wipe them off the second you get them, doesn't matter. Because the receiving of the ashes is an act of your heart. It's a statement of your intent between you and God. And that's what happens this day. And you pledge to spend the next 40 days and the next, what is six or seven Sundays, Focusing on opening up your heart. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence, for it is only by your gracious gift that we are given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. You may come as you are ready.
So it's suggested that in this uh, section that you are invited to kneel, or you can just sort of take a bowed posture, but you're going to have to read the screen. So I will start. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of Christ's resurrection. We're going to close with singing, O Master, let me walk with thee, and then I'll um, give you a blessing and a charge. So let us sing together. May the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.